Hello and welcome to this Facebook seminar, coming to you live from Wound Care Today in Milton Keynes. My name is Rachel Talkington Stokes and I'm the Global Medical and Clinical Strategy Director for Convertech. I'm delighted to be joined by Alison Parnham, a Clinical Nurse Specialist in Tissue Viability from Nottingham. We've had a fantastic day here today in Milton Keynes and we're excited to be able to carry this clinical education into this evening via Facebook. Today we're going to be looking at how to defy hard to heal wounds with an early intervention antibiotic strategy. We'll be introducing you to the concept of wound hygiene. So please feel free to submit a question at any point during the presentation and we will aim to answer as many as possible during the Q&A session at the end. After the event, you will be able to access a certificate of attendance, which you'll be able to use as part of your CPD hours for revalidation. We will be sharing the link at the end of the presentation, and we'd love to hear from where you've been watching tonight. Let us know if you're here in Milton Keynes or watching from further away. So we'll now move on to the presentation. The learning objectives for this presentation is to understand the link between biofilm and hard to heal wounds. It's to understand the need for early intervention. Are we waiting too long? It's to understand what is wound hygiene and how an early intervention, antibiofilm based approach can be applied in clinical practice. So when we think about biofilm and it's linked to hard to heal wounds, what is biofilm? Well, what we know is microbial cells with biofilm attached to a living or a non-living surface. We know there are complex polymicrobial community embedded within a self-produced extracellular matrix. And the biofilm provides tolerance to antimicrobial agents and host defenses. This causes persistent inflammation and infection. We also know there is a growing body of evidence out there to support the notion of biofilm in wounds. There's work here being conducted by many and around 78% of chronic wounds will have biofilm within them. And the work from Malone et al clearly shows from a meta-analysis that these clinical assumptions, biofilms are ubiquitous. They survive and are everywhere, and particularly in human chronic non-healing wounds. So if it's widely accepted that biofilm is present in the majority of hard to heal wounds and as a barrier to healing, that biofilm is complex, difficult to treat, reforms rapidly and is tolerant to antiseptics and antibiotics. Why are we waiting to intervene earlier with a biofilm-based wound care approach? So back in March last year, we had an expert advisory panel meeting. This meeting was really where we asked the attendees to look at their current clinical practice. We asked them to identify the barriers to maybe why people do not intervene early enough in biofilm-based wound care and potentially look at the opportunities and the solutions to improve outcomes and patient care. This was published in December last year through the JWC and really within this document it starts to illustrate a platform of how we can change our practice. So some of the questions we talked about addressing the, bio, uh, the barriers to making the case for interior invention, one of the key things was wound terminology. And this really was based on the notion of chronic. What does chronic mean? You know, we talk about chronic maybe being acceptance, maybe being that wounds will not go on to heal. And Chris Murphy, who was one of the chair of the panel within this document, talks about pressing a snooze button. It's about passively accepting these wounds and just managing them and not actually progressing them towards wound healing. So we think about this terminology and how we can improve this terminology. Because also off the back of this, we think about the importance that to payers and providers of healthcare, does the word chronic mean this condition is unresolvable? Does it mean that we're not going to be able to heal these wounds? So there really is a call to eliminating the word chronic and moving towards the word hard to heal. So Alison, I guess what I'd like to ask you is, do you favour this move from chronic towards hard to heal wounds? Absolutely, I think it's, a, I think it's an exciting and excellent approach to move away from the complacency associated with the word chronic we need to look at this wound is hard to heal, what are the interventions that we need to take forward and move away from this acceptance, this frame of mind that this is chronic, therefore it's not going to heal and actually turn that round and say, yes, it can heal um, and look at the fact that it's a hard to heal wound and why is it failing to heal? Absolutely. And the other thing that the experts talked about was they recognise wound care is in crisis. 
they, they recognise that at the end of the day there could be a piece of the puzzle missing. And is this piece of the puzzle biofilm? So often we think about, you know, is there belief in biofilm? What do we as clinicians understand in biofilm? Do we need to bust the myth of biofilm? And I think at the end of the day, you know, we maybe think about this because we can't see biofilm. We know there's not currently a detection device for biofilm. And also potentially the opportunity for increasing education around what biofilm is. So would you consider wound biofilm in your clinical practice to be a problem? Yes, a huge problem. Um, supported by the evidence out there that biofilm is associated with the failing to heal wound. We see biofilm with, with patients with, with failing to heal wounds in the community. We see that in leg ulcer clinics. And, and the majority of wounds that, that I think tissue viability see are failing to heal because of biofilm. Yeah. Okay, and I think as well, you know, as clinicians, we often think about, you know, holistic management. I mean, how many times do we hear the patient as a whole, not just the whole in the patient? And I think, you know, the other thing we read when we hear about biofilm, and very much we heard from our expert panel, was this notion of don't confuse the comorbidities with the cause. What, what does this actually mean for us as clinicians? Yeah, I think, I think it is a statement that's banded around, and I think we need to um, clarify that confusion, not be confused between the two, that comorbidities is about the holistic assessment of the patient. We, it's absolutely fundamental that we address those holistic comorbidity factors and that we manage them, we control them, we maintain them, so better diabetic control, better nutritional intake, um, supporting that venous insufficiency. Um, and, and so yes, we need to be taking that, that forward. Okay, so I think obviously we, we've heard the reasons behind the barriers, so would you now like to share with us your clinical experience yes. of actually biofilm-based wound management? Yes. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to lead on from what Rachel's been saying about biofilm and share my clinical experiences of a biofilm-based wound care approach within clinical practice. So biofilm-based wound care approach is about initially that early and timely wound assessment. So early wound assessment at the initial point of contact with your patient is absolutely crucial to, to uh, wound assessment and appropriate management. So timely wound assessment facilitates that early identification of the failing to heal wound that we're talking about. It will identify factors likely to delay healing, so it will look at those comorbidities, those factors that we need to look at in addition to the, the cause of the wound itself. So the comorbidities are around the factors um, associated with holistic assessment and the cause, just to clarify that, the cause is about the local um, reasons for, for why that wound is failing to heal. So we're looking at timely wound assessment to prompt um, diagnosis of wound infection and initiate early antibiotics if that's appropriate for the infected wound. To expedite biofilm detection, so to take that forward into the, the transition to biofilm-based wound care is absolutely crucial for the, for the failing to heal wound. So I looked at the evidence out there in the literature and, and carried out a systematic review to look at the evidence um, through, through my dissertation. So this became key and there, were lot, there was a plethora of evidence out there and it was very clear that debridement is a complete prerequisite to effective biofilm based wound care. We know that debridement influences the microenvironment of the wound by physical degradation of the biofilm matrix. However, we also know, as the literature suggests, that debridement alone does not provide adequate reduction in biofilm. We know that biofilm is proved to reform within 24 hours, so it becomes a constant battle against that, that biofilm. We know that topical antimicrobials alone do not eradicate biofilm with increased tolerance as biofilm matures. And we also know that emerging antibiotic resistance calls for a non-antibiotic strategy. So we can look at this evidence and we can still ask the question, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to us? What's the answer to this evidence? And the answer to the evidence is a combination of strategies. It's a synergistic approach, a partnership in looking at physical debridement of the wound bed itself, focusing on the wound bed to disrupt and to remove that biofilm, whilst the topical antimicrobials will then continue to destroy biofilm and prevent reformation of that biofilm. So that synergistic partnership will work towards, uh, move that wound towards the healing wound. 
So the evidence um, to take that a little step further into clinical practice, what I developed from, from um, collaborating that evidence together was to develop an algorithm for biofilm-based wound care. And was really just at the beginning um, of continuing with, with this and, and taking it forward. So the protocol of care that, that is with built into this algorithm is about cleansing the wound bed. It's about focusing and paying attention to the wound bed in addition to those wider comorbidities. It's about debridement and it's about refashioning. It's about focusing on the edge of the wound, um, which you'll see on the, on the next video about um, curetting um, through debridement and refashioning um, of that dead tissue. And then leading on to the management and preventing uh, biofilm reformation. So this algorithm looks at early assessment, is the wound failing to heal? That might be recognised at two weeks. The failing to heal wound might be recognised at four weeks. It, or, or have the factors been addressed? Have the, the comorbidity factors been addressed? Um, is the wound not responding to treatment? Could there be biofilm present? What are we seeing? What are the clinical indications? And if, if there's a yes to, to those series of questions, then it takes us into what format of debridement are we going to use and the two the, the boxes at the bottom of the algorithm look at is um, does is, is debridement required and if debridement is required what form of debridement are we going to use and that would depend to on a certain extent to to the clinical skills um, and and the wound type and what we're trying to achieve <coughs> so in this video what you can actually see is curettage so so i'm curetting um, a wound that is failing to heal. The comorbidities of this patient have already been addressed because the patient's in, in compression. Um, and so, so the venous disease is being reversed by, by compression, yet the wound continues to fail to heal because the cause of the local wound failing to heal has not been addressed. So by curetting, we're looking at debriding and refashioning the wound edge of this, wo of, of, of this wound bed, removing the macerated tissue, removing some of that biofilm and removing the crusty wound edge. So just to support that really, what, what I want to show you are three clinical examples of where I have been using curatage um, based on, on the evidence within my dissertation and taking that out into clinical practice and sharing it with the tissue viability team within my community setting and, and beginning now to take it into the leg ulcer clinics. So this was my first patient and this was really a, a light bulb moment having done some, some training um, on curatage um, and the actions of, of curatage. So this was a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so we can see the comorbidities there, uh, with a reduced ABPI and therefore in modified compression, so the comorbidities were being addressed. This wound was static and present for three years. You can see the slime across the surface, you can see the greeny tinge that it has, and it just smacked me in the face of being biofilm. And, and I wanted to take this patient into biofilm-based wound care. And I began that with, with two weekly um, curatage. And what we found that after three years of a static wound with huge cost implications and huge impact on that patient's quality of life, that that wound, as you can see from the picture and the dates that it actually healed within three months. And that was the, the light bulb moment for me to say that we have to take this forward. Um, and that was my one patient, my one chance to be able to take this further into clinical practice. This was my second patient. So this was a patient with diabetes, um, some obesity, some lymphedema, so lots of comorbidities going on there that, that made the assessment and the management particularly complex. This patient was maintained in compression hosiery until she sustained a trauma injury um, resulting in a hematoma. The wound was present then, as you can see from the first picture by the time I saw this patient, the wound was present for a year. You can see the slime across the, the surface, very typical indication of the presence of biofilm. And I know that biofilm isn't always visible, but in this particular case, the, the slime, the shine, um, showed the presence of the biofilm. So again, we entered this patient into this, this biofilm-based wound care approach, and we got um, fairly rapid healing results. Um, and and the, the wound healed, the healing trajectory occurred again within a three month period. And there is evidence out there to support that with the early and correct and timely intervention strategies, we will get healing of the failing to heal wound um, in around three months. So that continues to, to um, drive me forward into biofilm-based wound care and we need to, to be spreading this out to, to more patients and developing plans of care and introducing those protocols for those patients. 
and this is my final patient. And this patient is a 66-year-old gentleman diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 26. So right fixed ankle joint and ulceration of his right leg since 2011. This gentleman was going to bed with a, with a bin liner on his leg to avoid the leakage um, coming from, from his bandages and to, to keep, try and keep, his, um, keep the odour down and to keep his, um, his bed sheets clean. So a huge quality of life implication. He did have a right toe amputation in 2007 and so there was a degree of, of mixed comorbidity, of mixed arterial and, and venous disease. Um, so he had a static non-healing circumferential gaiter um, ulcer for six years um, and this is where, where nurses need to start to recognise this isn't a chronic wound, this is a failing to heal wound and yes we can absolutely do something about it. So this circumferential wound can be seen on the, on the first um, picture which is when we initiated the curettage followed by Aquacel AG plus extra dressing. Okay. Just moving on with those pictures we can see um, the change you can see it's the same wound and the changing shape of that you can see the change in, in the tissue type you can see the the wound shrinking the wound contraction the granulation tissue the healthy granulation tissue uh, pro proliferating into that wound bed and then finally this wound and, and it does make me feel hugely emotional and I'm still seeing this patient because there are still some um, some wounds on, on the sort of lateral and medial aspect but you can see from the anterior aspect of this patient's wound that, that it's healed and it's hugely satisfying that, that knowing that after six years this patient can go to bed without um, a bin liner on his leg. Okay so in summary there are some key factors that, that we need to address um, and, and we know, as Rachel has already said, that biofilm is present in at least 78%, if not more, of those hard to heal wounds. We know that biofilm creates a sustained inflammatory response, it impairs the growth of granulation tissue, and it prevents the growth of epithelialization. So it stops the wound from continuing to heal. Clicker's a little bit slow. Biofilm is tolerant, so we also know about tolerance. We know that biofilm is tolerant to antiseptics and antibiotics. And crucially, biofilm is the cause of local infection, which is why it's so important that we address the failing to heal wound and the, the link to, to that biofilm. And, and so it requires new strategies within a biofilm-based wound care approach. So the future of hard to heal wounds, why are we waiting? What are the benefits out there of introducing um, early biofilm based wound care strategies? So we can prevent antibiotic overuse, we can reduce that microbial resistance, we can ensure appropriate use of antimicrobial dressings. We can, we can start to use and introduce, which is where I'm at currently, protocols of care to influence clinical decisions out there um, in, in community settings, in hospital settings, in care homes. We can recommend prompt action through the introduction of those protocols and algorithms of, of clinical practice. And we need to be remembering the importance and the ongoing importance um, of cleansing, debriding, refashioning and managing that wound with the correct antimicrobial dressings. We need to look at reducing infection. That's a huge improved outcome for that patient. And, and if we end up with fewer amputations, that has a huge implications for patient's quality of life. That's cost, that's reducing pain, that's reducing infection. And, and I'm already seeing faster wound healing for, for the patients that I'm taking into this biofilm-based wound care approach. So a huge implication of, of improving quality of life. Health economics, we know that, that the failing to heal wound is a huge burden on the NHS. So we can look at cost savings by, by using this biofilm-based wound care approach and it will ensure the appropriate use of, of resources. Okay, thank you, thank you for listening. Thank, <coughs> thank you. you. And I think you alluded there to some of the key benefits that are really important when we look at obviously improving patient outcomes. I think the notion of the benefits were clearly articulated there, so thank you. So now we're going to look at introducing the early intervention antibiofilm strategy, which is wound hygiene. What is wound hygiene? Well, wound hygiene is an early intervention strategy which was created by clinicians for clinicians 
and it's there to really address the barriers to why these wounds are hard to heal or fail to heal. It's for all clinicians managing all wounds in all settings and it is built on this very simple four-step regime. Hygiene is a word we're all very familiar with. We have dental hygiene, we have hand hygiene. We practice this routinely, habitually, and this is absolutely where we need to go as clinicians for wound hygiene. There are four very simple steps. It's intuitive. Cleanse, and this is about cleansing the wound, but also the peri-wound area. It's about, as Alison said, debriding. And it's about all different types of debridement. What does this mean? From debridement with a piece of gauze or a monofilament pad, right through to sharp debridement, um, surgical debridement, what's ever needed for that wound at that time. It's about refashioning, a term maybe we're not very familiar with. We talk about the edges in wound care being very, very important. We know biofilm sits around those wound edges, but we also know with wounds to heal, with epithelialization, the wound edges are so important. So by refashioning, agitating the edges is a really key part of a wound hygiene protocol. And lastly, it's about dress the wound. It's about after accurate assessment, deciding what is the most appropriate dressing. Understanding that a lot of these hard to heal wounds have the presence of biofilm. It's about selecting an appropriate dressing with antimicrobial, antibiofilm properties, which is what you determine after your wound assessment. So it's very much this four-step process. This is very much about giving confidence and giving courage to those clinicians who are maybe practicing out there on their own, that absolutely all wounds deserve to have wound hygiene and something we should practice routinely, habitually, at each dressing change. So to further define what wound hygiene is, we hosted a meeting last summer in 2019 where we extended the panel and we had a consensus meeting. This consensus meeting really did start to define what is wound hygiene. And you can see here from the body of um, authorship and also the strong reviewers, we've got global consensus around what is wound hygiene and why we should have an early intervention antibiofilm strategy. Within this document, it very much talks to all levels of clinicians, from a basic newly qualified clinician to a healthcare professional, up through to a surgeon consultant level. It talks about care in all kinds of practice, from community practices, outpatients, into the surgery. So it's very much a content that is really of value for you and your practice out there to improve outcomes. The publication of this consensus document has recently been um, available. You can download the consensus document and here's the information. And also it's a supplement in the March edition of the Journal of Wound Care. And what we need to think about in summary is biofilm is a major cause of delayed wound healing and it's present in the majority of hard to heal wounds. Wound hygiene recognises and addresses that biofilm is the root of the problem with wounds becoming and remaining hard to heal. Don't wait to intervene with biofilm based wound care. Early intervention can improve outcomes for hard to heal wounds. Hygiene in everyday practice is not an optional activity. Wound hygiene is a core, non-negotiable component of good wound care and this is the way which we will move our non-healing, hard to heal wounds onto that positive wound healing trajectory. It's going to provide better patient outcomes. It's going to give benefits to payers, to purchasers, to provide cost efficient and effective wound management. So I would encourage you please to take the time to look at the consensus document to have the courage and confidence to practice wound hygiene wherever you work out there in your clinic setting to therefore set your patients up for success towards wound healing. So now we'll move on to our real-time question and answer session. Remember you can take part at any time by commenting on the video. So now moving on to our first question. How do you know if there's biofilm present in a wound? Great question. Shall I yeah, I'll begin? Sure. Um, I don't think you always do, is the honest answer. Um, in all the evidence that I've read around biofilm, um, th there are clinical indications. There are different clinical, clinical indications, but they're not always visual. Sometimes we can see very clearly, like you saw from, from my patient cases, um, that there is a slime, there is a shine, it's a jelly type structure and that's very mature biofilm but what we can't often see is the early forming less mature biofilm 
and I think one of the key indicators that we should be identifying is this wound is not responding to treatment, therefore it's, it's failing to heal or it's a hard to heal wound. Um, and much of the evidence out there points to the majority of wounds that are hard to heal, it's because of biofilm presence. Thank you. The next question we have is from Caroline. So, do you need to be a tissue viability specialist to train in mechanical debridement of this type? Very good question, Caroline. I think it's, it's a debate that needs to be out there. Um, there were sessions earlier on today that looked at sharp debridement using a, a curette. And I think as a registered nurse, that falls within your own um, scope of competent practice, really. Um, and yes, it's good to have training. Training isn't always readily available, but as you, you know, today it has been available. And it's about taking that back and being safe. It's about having guidelines. It's about developing those guidelines, and that may be the responsibility of tissue viability. But I don't think it should be in the long term with, with the right package, the right protocol um, in place, that it should be just um, tissue viability that are carrying that out. Um, and, and you can see from, from the, the healing um, that, that we've been able to, to see from introducing biofilm-based wound care that it shouldn't be just the tissue viability um, specialist that, that leads with mechanical debridement. And mechanical debridement, as Rachel said, covers a whole host. It doesn't mean necessarily taking a sharp tool to that patient's wound. And, and yes, that does need, need some, some training, but there are other forms of mechanical debridement um, that, that might be a, a debridement cloth, for example, that would still be uh, disrupting that biofilm. So it needs to be very clearly thought about with your own area of practice of how you take this forward, really. And I think also to add to that is recognizing if it's outside of your skill set to refer on. Yeah. I think, you know, debridement is a very general term that we need to introduce on all wounds. And I think, as you've alluded to, there are many different types of debridement. But one of the positive signs of being a good clinician is recognizing where your skill set starts and somebody Absolutely. else's or stops and somebody else's begins and referring on. And I think having that, you know, multifaceted approach to be able to refer on and give the patient and the wound the best chance at getting good outcomes is what we need to think about rather yep. than is it somebody's defined skill set. Yeah. Next question from Samantha. Are there any spe specific conditions that make biofilm more prevalent within wounds? I think probably the presence of devitalized tissue, um, because the presence of devitalized tissue in a wound um, brings chronic exudate into the wound, it attracts bacteria into the wound, and biofilm is formed from the high presence of, of um, bacteria in a wound, so, so that the, the growing bacteria in, in a wound that is failing to heal because of the, the dead tissue that's in the wound bed. Um, will continue to harbour that bacteria. The bacteria continue to grow and grow until they reach this critical mass and then they change their characteristics, the bacteria change their characteristics and are able to secrete biofilm. Um, so wounds that, that have devitalised tissue in them are more likely to harbour biofilm. Next question, um, does that also include stage four plus pressure sores? Yes, if it's, a, if it's a category four pressure ulcer and it's failing to heal and there is the presence of devitalized tissue of slough, um, then potentially that could absolutely harbor biofilm. So we're looking at all types of wounds that are hard to heal, that are failing to heal. Okay. And from Jane, should you stop using antimicrobial dressings after two weeks? That's such a good question. <laughs> um, you've probably yep. got something to say about that as well. Yeah. So you know, two weeks, um, there is no rule about two weeks use. I think this is a guideline, it's a tool, not a rule as we say. And I think what is good practice is to regularly review what is appropriate for your wounds and your management plan. And two weeks is a reasonable length of time to recognise, are you getting what you would expect from your management plan? So I think that antimicrobials out there are safe, incredibly safe to be used for longer than two weeks. Yeah. It's about regular review. And within the document, you will see where we talk about the different types of antimicrobial dressings, and that if you're not getting the results that you would expect, or the wound is still static, stalled, and fail to heal, then review your management plan 
and potentially move to a different choice of dressing would be my advice. But anything Absolutely, to no, to I, I, would, I would agree with that. And I think that, that it was banded around for, for a number of years um, that the two week challenge um, let, uh, was said um, and it was to really focus on the correct use of antimicrobials, but it never meant the two week challenge means that you only use an antimicrobial for two weeks because that means that the biofilm will return and that we're back to square one with that hard, hard to heal wound. So it's very individual and as Rachel said, the, 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 or the two week challenge is, uh, means that it's reviewing, as Rachel said, that wound every two weeks, not stopping the antimicrobial necessarily. What's the difference between timers and wound hygiene? Good question again. Um, timers, um, also known as times, it depends what you're working with within your, your, your protocol, within your wound management strategies. Timers is the assessment of the wound. Wound hygiene is the, is the, the protocol of, of care, is the action that you take based on um, the assessment using timers. So timers is about the tissue type, it's about the inflammation, is it inflamed, is it infected, or is, is the biofilm present? The M in timers is about the moisture balance, is it too wet, is it too dry? The E is around the edge of the wound, which, which we've already addressed within the presentation and the refashioning of that. And the R is about um, regeneration and, and repair. And the S is about holistically assessing the social factors. So looking at that assessment should take you into wound hygiene as a, as a protocol of care. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say the two can run synonymously Absolutely. together and complement yeah. each other for, for best yeah. practice. And Deborah, in primary care where mechanical debridement isn't available, what's your top tip for removing biofilm? Great question. Yep, I think we look at other forms of mechanical debridement. So there will be, there should be uh, types of mechanical uh, debridement that are available to you within primary care. So mechanical debridement doesn't just mean sharp debridement. Sharp debridement is a form of active or mechanical debridement. Um, and so I'm sure that, that your formulary is likely, and, and I may be wrong, but I'm, so I'm guessing, should hold um, some options of debridement cloths, for example. That's still an example of mechanical debridement. And we would expect that to be within the, the protocol of care. It's certainly within the algorithm that I've developed, um, that that's an interim measure as you pass that, that referral on to someone who, who is competent to, to take that step further into sharp debridement. And our final question, can you explain what you mean by refashioning in more detail and who can do it? So I'm happy to, to take that. Refashioning, I think, is a, is a new word to a mm. lot of us, but I think, understandably, we've talked about the importance of the edge. And refashioning is about agitating the wound edge. And often is, this is with a type of debridement, so it can be done with um, a piece of gauze or a monofilament pad, but focusing very much on the edge, where a lot of those senescent dead cells live and actually thinking about the notion of curled edges may actually be harbouring some bacteria and biofilm under there. So the analogy within the document talks about cliffs and beaches. It talks about shallow edges and actually bringing our attention to the importance of the wound edge. And this is why refashioning is a step absolutely that the consensus calls out because it's very, very important to progress those wounds to healing. So it can be done with debridement tools, such as a curette or a scalpel, and it can be done with mechanical force through using mm. a piece of gauze or one of these monofilament cloths and out there. So very much new terminology, refashioning, but I think it really means we focus on the wound edge and it's about agitating to pinpoint bleeding as well and having the courage to, you know, the analogy within the document talks about um, the landscape and that actually wounds are war zones. You know, we often think about them and trying to create a landscape that encourages positive wound progression. So getting rid of this material that sits there, yeah. particularly in the edges, is really, really important to encourage wound progression and wound healing. Absolutely. And, and to have short term goals. Um, so if the goal currently is to refashion, then you set that within your plan of care. We should never have a goal for a hard to heal wound that is just to heal. We must have shorter, short term goals. So if it's about addressing the edge of the wound, then you're at that, that key stage of, of refashioning. And I think one final thing to add as well is within and how wounds progress is as the wound starts to heal, the levels of wound hygiene, you still need to cleanse, debride, refashion and dress, but the extent at which you may need to bride, the extent at which you may need to refashion, and then your choice of dressing may be very different yeah. from when the wound first presented, which may have had devitalized tissue 
very yeah. likely to have biofilm. So as that wound progresses, your levels of wound hygiene decrease as appropriate, and potentially you step down to a non-antimicrobial antibiofilm yes. dressing. Yeah, and the plan of care should reflect those changes. Absolutely. So this concludes our training session live tonight from Milton Keynes. Thank you so much for watching and submitting your questions. We hope you found it useful. To visit your certificate of attendance, visit the link shown on the screen now, or alternatively, it will be pinned in the comments. For those of you watching from Milton Keynes, please come and say hello on the Convertech stand tomorrow. We'd love to meet you and hear what you thought about tonight's session. We do have copies also of the consensus document, and we hope you've enjoyed the event tonight and gained a better understanding on the concept of wound hygiene and how it can help us tackle those hard to heal wounds. Don't forget to like the Wound Care Today Facebook page to hear first about the future events. And thank you and have a good evening.